guess it. What? Please let's let's sit down. The the CEO uh, of the foundation, Max Max Sepogwana. They kept me briefed about uh, this party, uh, about what was happening and, uh, and what he expected. So it, was, it became quite clear <clears throat> that it was going to be a lovely, a lovely, joyful evening. So I, I went to home affairs and then told them the truth that uh, uh, I've lost my birth certificate. Could they please uh, issue me with a new one? They did. And I find to my surprise that in fact uh, my birthday is not the 18th it's the 25th so I think this party is a curtain raiser the real one must be on the 25th I think we should all agree about that but let me say thank you very much to everybody for coming uh, uh, for all of us being here this evening, uh, the people here on the stage, and people down there, uh, to celebrate this, this birthday. I must apologize for His Majesty, uh, King uh, Mrs. Zuluka Gazueltini, uh, who has just left. He asked me to apologize for that. Uh, and the reason is that uh, he's got to wake up at home in the morning uh, because of various commitments there. So he's had to be driving overnight. Uh, really, I, I appreciated that very much because made a very, 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 very big sacrifice to be here and now to be driving back at night. So he, he said he should apologize uh, for, for his departure. Um, it was said, uh, Lupi here said, uh, this is not a day of speeches, it's a celebration. So I, I shouldn't make speeches or a speech. Uh, I asked one of my old friends here what to say. He just laughed at me. Uh, I took that to mean uh, he was suggesting that he thought I knew what to say or not to say. But I was a bit inspired by uh, this rendition about my biography. So I thought I would, I would add to, to what they said. Uh, you know, uh, one of them talked about uh, uh, Scanlan Street <laughs> in Queenstown. Uh, indeed, quite correct. Now, that street was then the second last street out of White Queenstown. Uh, so the street at the back, that was the last street. And beyond that was the African township. Now at that end of Scanlan Street, 
was uh, an agricultural showground. And at the other end of Scanlon Street was uh, an open square, which was really used for rallies uh, on the edge of the African township. The picture, the second picture that uh, the young Werane brought is me and one of my cousins, Kabe Dimwerane, who was the youngest son of the family, Mike Mwerane. Um, so we come out of school uh, sometime in 1952. And then there's noise, you get bands, bands playing, brass bands, at that end of Scanlon Street. <coughs> so we rush there, and uh, we can't get into the showgrounds. We stand around the fence, and there's big performances inside. Uh, bands, march pasts, and this and that and that, spectacular, very spectacular. <coughs> and then, uh, as we are standing there watching all this, my cousin, Kabedi, says, look, look down there, look down there. And there was my uncle on his bicycle, slowly driving uh, up this road. So, so we hide among the people until he had passed. And then we ran home. So by the time he came back, we were watering the garden. <coughs> He didn't say anything until the evening. Uh, he called us um, and said, where were you in the afternoon? So we said, no, we were watering the garden. So, uh, so we had a little a bit of a, a few lashes. He didn't, ask, didn't explain why. Uh, that same year, was sitting there at home on Scanlon Street. And then a, a loud somebody drives down Scanlon Street with a loud hailer, going towards this other town, this open square there. And I, I remember this thing. The only thing I remember about what he was saying was, Ilonto. Then he would say, bah, 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 Ilonto. And then they'd go there and be gathering at that place. It was called the Estigidin. So my cousin and myself decided to go and listen to these rallies. <laughs> that was mobilization for the defiance campaign, 1952. <clears throat> so they are recruiting uh, volunteers. So we decide that we must volunteer. But we understand from what is being said that you have got to be a member of the ANC. So, and it costs two and six. Yeah, I see David Makura here. He does not know what two and six was. <laughs> two shillings and six pence. So we collect uh, empty bottles of uh, Coke. Then those days you submit the bottle and you get a deposit back. So we collected the bottles, took them back at the shops behind, last street. Uh, until we were two and six each. So we went back to the rally. Uh, it was rally, it was very many rallies every weekend. So we go back there to join the ANC. I was 10 years old and my cousin was about 8. They turned us away. They said, no, keep the money until you grow a little bit bad, long, big, bigger and then come back. So we couldn't join. I joined the ANC Youth League uh, uh, four years later. 
uh, and have stayed there ever since. Unfortunately, they have never chased me away. <coughs> I was chased away from somewhere else, but not, not the ANC. <coughs> not, not the ANC. They mentioned, somebody mentioned in this biography that we got expelled from Lovedale, which we were, were expelled in 1959. If this is because the principal expelled somebody wrongly, thinking that fellow was a member of the, of the Youth League. He wasn't. Uh, so he expelled him. So we discussed the matter as a Youth League and said, no, but we can't allow this to happen. So we went on strike demanding the return of this person who was wrongly expelled. We're telling the prime the, 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 the principal, this is the wrong person. We won't tell you who's the right one, uh, but it's the wrong person you've expelled. Um, so he expelled us anyway. So I went, uh, I went home to my mother in the Transkai the father was the uh, editor of New Age in PE, Nelson Mandela Bay now. Um, so we had to study at home in order to write the final matric exams uh, at St. John's College in Tata, I think one of them said, it's correct. Uh, so after some months, I say to my mother, uh, you know, my father said nothing about us being expelled from, from school. And she said, well, why didn't you write to him? So I said, okay, so I wrote to him. Uh, he knew about this because he was writing about it, that was strike. Uh, so he responded. Uh, is, the only thing he said was, wh when you've made an agreement with other comrades, your task is to keep to the agreement. He didn't say this was right or wrong or whatever, but you must keep to your way with the comrades. Uh, so now these stories I've told you, never turn right to go to the showgrounds. Because that was a fun, really big celebration. That's why we got beaten. Uh, but you can turn left and go to stay in and join the ANC, provided that you are old enough. But once you are there, once you are there, do what you've agreed with the comrades. Uh, Yeah, Amin Pungwe talked about, uh, of course, I finished at Lovedale and Johannesburg and so on. In the end, I was sent by the ANC to school in England and I had to pass through Dar es Salaam in Tanganyika. And he did, as I was saying, the Tang Tanganyikans gave me a travel document, uh, which was not quite right. <laughs> But I, I say to people, you know, uh, this was 1962. I was seen off Dar es Salaam Airport to London by a very big delegation. It was Julius Nyerere, it was Kenneth Kaunda, it was Oliver Tambo. So some people don't believe that story. They say, uh-uh, you. I said, That's, that, those are the people who saw me off. Um, it's, it's the truth. It's the half-truth. <laughs> it's because uh, O.R. Tambo and, uh, and Mwalim 
were seeing of Kenneth Kaunda. <laughs> he was flying to London to negotiate for the independence of Zambia. I just happened to be on the same plane. <laughs> So it's the truth, I was seen off by those three. <laughs> so off we went to England and so on, came back. Um, the OAU uh, had a, a committee called the Liberation Committee. Um, so one of its meetings uh, was held in Kampala in Uganda. At the time that Idi Amin was there as head of state. So we attended the meeting and Idi Amin kept, kept interrupting. Yeah. Yeah, it's a ministerial meeting and then he would come and they adjourn because His Excellency wants to address them. Yeah. And he would, one message, we must intensify the struggle first in Angola, and after we finish there, we must go to Mozambique. After we finish in Mozambique, we go to Zimbabwe. Of course, we are very fed up with this Amin story. He's postponing the struggle in South Africa until whenever. <laughs> and fortunately, he says, Idi Amin, that all of the liberation movement delegations should not leave Kampala without meeting him. Fine. Uh, so indeed we meet him. So OR is a, we must now present our case. Your Excellency, you can't say that. These things you've been saying. Why are you postponing our struggle? Say, my brother, let me explain. You see, this is called misinformation. The reason I was doing it all the time, because I want them, those other people, to listen. They will think our strategy is to go to Angola, and then Mozambique, and then Zimbabwe. What they don't know, our target is Cape Town. <laughs> So, that's an important lesson from Idi Amin. And of course, uh, many years later, South Africa is free. Um, we have an appointment, we got a, a state visit to pay to Mali. Uh, at the time, my uh, president was president, was President Konare. Uh, and he insists, well, the Malians insist, that on our delegation we must include the Minister of Sports. We couldn't quite understand why, but nevertheless we did. So we went to, uh, to, to Mali, and we'd incorporated in, our prog in the program there that we must visit a Timbuktu. And indeed, we visited Timbuktu. You remember there was a famous library there the Ahmed Baba Library, with this tremendous store of books and manuscripts and so on, about everything, many things African. So uh, we get to the library, Ahmed Baba, in Timbuktu, and really it was a tiny little room. It was one room, not very big, and you see these books and manuscripts stacked on the table in the middle of the room stacked like this and some uh, shelves on the walls one there was a BBC SAP, sorry, SAPC uh, cameraman who was with us there as we are walking around he puts down his camera uh, and he comes up to me and he says you can't allow this you can't allow this must do something. So I say to him, no, but uh, what, what have we done now? He says, no, 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 President. You see these books and these manuscripts, very valuable. 
they are going to get stolen, they are going to get messed up. So of course, do something, a proper library. So I said to him, okay, okay, I hear you. So later we go back to Bamako, the capital, and have a bilateral meeting. Yeah. So I say to President Konari, President Konari, we must do so you must do something about that library. Because this extraordinary store of knowledge of the African continent will really disappear. Uh, you, you've got to build a proper library, da 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 da. So President Konare says, uh, now President Big, you know very well that Mali is poor. So I said, President, I said, yes, I know. He says, therefore, I need advice from you. Uh, the people, particularly in the rural areas, they, they don't have clean water. Now, the advice I'm looking for from you is, the little money we have, do I deliver clean water to the people in the rural areas, or do I build Ahmed Baba Library? So I said, President, I will not answer your question. But let's agree. You deliver the water, we will deliver the library. So that's how we came to build the library, the Ahmed Baba Library in Timbuktu. And then uh, at the same meeting, uh, President Konare says, you know that uh, next year, January, we are hosting the Africa Cup of Nations. So I said, yes, President, I know that. He says, we, we managed to collect enough money uh, to build the stadium, to host the, the matches. The stadia are ready, very well built, and all of that. Uh, but the money, we've run out of money. There are no buses to carry the teams. There are no sedans to drive around the officials. Uh, the telephone system can only take 20,000 uh, 20, 20, telephone lines. And we have got no medical system, health system to support the, the tournament. And we have no money. So I said, but then, President, the best thing to do is... Uh, we better go back to CAF and say, you can't host it. He says, no, no, no. We must host it. You, you, President, says Konari to me, you are the one who's talking about all the time about an African renaissance. Now, how can we as Mali, as part of the renaissance, if we can't even host the soccer tournament? What kind of renaissance is that? So... Please, it's your job, it's your job to make sure that the Africa Cup goes, goes through very well. Now we understood why he had wanted the Minister of Sport. And so we, we supplied the buses, we supplied the sedans, we supplied the health, we supplied the telephony. And indeed the Cup went off very well, but we had to carry that burden. Because uh, Konare said, this is to prove your, that you actually mean this African renaissance. You can't have a renaissance and you can't, and you can't host a soccer tournament. So that was done. Uh, then later, uh, changes take place in the Congo. You remember when... Uh, uh, the old man Kabila, Lohan Kabila, succeeded uh, Mobutu. And Julius Nyerere comes, he was here at home. So he says to me now, what are you doing about the Congo? And so I tell him. I say, Mwalimu, the, uh, we've discussed with them, the Congolese, to set up a particular kind of committee. We've set up the same committee 
which is going to look at everything. Uh, we are waiting uh, for them to tell us that the committee is ready. Our committee is ready. We are waiting for them to tell us their committee is ready. Uh, and then we will go to Kinshasa. Mwalimu says, uh, your task this week, today, tomorrow, send your delegation to Kinshasa, pack themselves, let them pack themselves in a hotel there, and tell Kabila that they will be there until his committee is ready. So now, I can't say Mwalimu, uh, uh, uh. he says, no, that is what you must do, where to do it? So Mwalimu is saying that, and he says, but you don't know the Congolese. You are waiting for them to come back to say committee is formed. They will only form the committee when we are sitting in the hotel. So okay, okay, Mwalimu, so we did. And Mwalimu was correct about that. So, uh, you know what happened in the Congo in the end. Uh, that we had to babysit this thing because this was Mwalimu's insistence uh, that you, you've got a responsibility to babysit the Congo and not wait for them to say we're ready about this and that. And that. You've got to make sure that they move. And because it's Mwalimu, it's an instruction. Uh, so we, 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 we did that. Now, uh, uh, there are many other stories I can tell you. One day I get a message from the U.S. Embassy here in Pretoria to say, George, George, that President Bush would like to talk to you. So I said, sure. And indeed he called. This was on the eve of the uh, invasion of Iraq in 2003. And George W. Bush uh, says to me, you know, what happens in a war, we, as you know that we are saying we are going to go and get into, into Iraq because of these weapons of mass destruction. Uh, but you go to war, people die. And I don't want to be the one person who now has to go to talk to the American mothers and fathers that their daughters and sons have died. I really don't want to do that. But can't avoid it if there's a war. I wish we wouldn't go to war. And one other reason is because there's already, already a lot of anti-Americanism. If we we'll go to war in Iraq, that will get worse. And I don't want that. So I agree with him. I say, President, you're quite right on all counts. Therefore, don't go to war. Yeah. No, 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 but uh, does he have weapons of mass destruction? So I say, President, we sent a delegation to Iraq to talk to them about that and prepare a report. It's with your ambassador in New York. It's with the Security Council. And our people who went to Iraq say there are no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. That report is there in detail. Oh, he didn't know that, but he will check. Uh, and then I made a mistake. He says to me, if only I can get a signal from Saddam that he doesn't have, then we won't go to war. The mistake I made is I didn't ask him what signal would, would it be because we could get the signal from Saddam. I forgot. So after we put the phone down, I, I sent a message to his colleague in London, Tony Blair, to tell him about this, that George Bush forward and this is what we discussed. Please, can you get from him this, what signal does he want from Saddam? I know that the Prime Minister got the message. He never delivered to George Bush. Never delivered it. 
And so they went to war and indeed found that there were no weapons of mass destruction. If we had known what signal George Bush want, wanted, uh, and if Tony Blair had done his job of delivering our query, uh, maybe there would not have been a war in Iraq in 2003. Now, comrades, uh, then, of course, at some point here at home, uh, my comrades say, look, we've had enough of you. Please go away. Uh, so, okay, I said, sure, all right. You are my bosses, I go. And a bit, a less, some time after that, I see a, a missed call on the telephone system. And it's got a 021, start 021, that's the Cape Town number. So I call it, I call the number, and somebody answers. So I say, look, I'm returning a call uh, which came from this number. So he says to me, uh, well, I can't tell who that is because this is the provincial headquarters of the ANC. Uh, so this is a general number, so, but it's extensions to a number of offices. So I can't tell who called. So I said, okay. All right, no, then, then that's fine. Uh, so he says, incidentally, who are you? So I tell him. And he says, what company do you work for? <laughs> and that told me that it was time to retire. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, and thanks for coming. Uh, <clears throat> Another big round of applause for the patron. Thank you, Mr. President.